Good morning, everybody. Matt Halpern here with episode 23 of the Chocolate Croissants podcast. On behalf of myself, Mr. Justin Goodman, and Mr. Jordan Goodman, we want to thank you very much for tuning in. If you've been with us for the past 23 weeks, or if you're a member of our group on Facebook, you guys are fucking awesome. This Facebook group that we have going is incredibly inspiring. I see tons of new friends on there that are helping each other out, that are asking questions for the episodes. We are sharing um, all sorts of ex exclusive content there answering questions ourselves. There's just a great conversation and there's a great vibe there. And if you are listening in for the first time or if you've been with us for a while and you're not part of this Facebook group, I would strongly encourage you to join. Just read, see what's going on there. <clears throat> you don't have to chime into the conversation if you don't want to but I think you'll find some value. Also, we have guests that have been on the podcast who are members of the group. Uh, for example, Benny Greb from our uh, two episodes ago, episode 21. Benny was there uh, in the group sharing <clears throat> a video answering direct questions from you guys as a follow-up to his episode. So we have a lot of interaction there. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of positive energy going on. So as hippie-ish as that sounds, I really hope you can join it. If you were on Facebook, go to www.facebook.com slash group slash chocolate croissants. Jump right in, say hi. We'll be there to say hi as well. Uh, I would also like to ask you guys that are listening a little favor. If you're like me and you consume most of your content on your phone, then on behalf of all of us, we would infinitely be grateful if you would click on the podcast app on your phone, open up the search and type in chocolate croissants. Once you find us, just click the subscribe button in the top right of your phone and you'll get our episodes every Monday. You don't have to worry about streaming it, you know, during, during the day at different times and running up your data, just download it. Hopefully you have Wi-Fi when you can do that. And then you can listen to us uninterrupted without having to, uh, to run out your data. So Lastly, I want to take a second to thank our very good friends at Rode Microphones. Um, they have been supporting us from the beginning. And as I always say, they're the reason why you're hearing me in your ear hole right now. Uh, they have all sorts of offerings, professional studio stuff for recording music. You can get podcast microphones there. You can get this USB mic that I have right now. You can get microphones to record great audio from your phone if you're just out and about. Highly recommend checking them out. Just go to roadmic.com. That's R-O-D-E-M-I-C, or you can follow them at roadmic on all their socials. Okay, on to episode 23. So about four times a week, I visit this cafe in Baltimore called The Corner Pantry. I started going there about a year ago, and I've been hooked ever since. My love for this place started with their English pastries, because I'm a big sucker for English food. Um, but it continued to grow with their coffee, their iced teas, their sandwiches, the daily cold bar, the Saturday donut, the lobster roll, the creative entrees, the constant swapping of the menu, the... Uh, pork fried rice, or excuse me, chicken fried rice. I wish they would make pork fried rice, actually. Um, and of course, they're ridiculous chocolate chip cookies. And speaking of the chocolate chip cookies, when our guest this week showed up at Jordan's apartment to record, he came bearing a box of about 13 freshly baked, quote unquote, secret recipe chocolate chip cookies. They're fucking delicious. And they're the creation of our guest this week. So Mr. Neil Hal owner and chef at the Corner Pantry, is here with episode 23. Neil is a truly lovely guy. He's great to be around. Um, he's been super gracious with me as I've come into the restaurant and just gotten to know him and the staff there. And his talents and his passion for his art go way beyond his ability to make good chocolate chip cookies. He's a seeming, uh, seemingly fearless business owner. He's a risk-taking chef. British transplant here in America, and he loves MMA and good podcasts, and I just really enjoyed getting to know him better throughout this whole conversation. We dig into business, we dig into food, we talk about nutrition, we talk about the MMA, uh, or rather we talk about MMA, Justin's going to punch me for saying that. Um, we talk about anxiety and Neil's general navigation through life, and I would just love for you to listen in. So without further blabber from me, Check out Mr. Neil Howe on episode 23 of the Chocolate Croissants podcast. Enjoy. Oh, we're recording right now? Oh, I guess we are recording right now. Yep. Okay. Well, um, hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 23 of the Chocolate Croissants podcast. I'm here with Jordan, Justin, I'm Matt, and our guest this week <laughs> is the amazing chef, and I say that because I just ate a whole bunch of his amazing food, Mr. Neil Howe from the Corner Pantry here in Baltimore, Maryland. Hi, Neil. Hey, how are you? Doing good. We are great. Thank you for stuffing mine and Justin's face with um, what do we have? We had we had curried monkfish, 
Um, we had the, the beef croquettes, liver, chicken liver, chicken liver toast. Oh, there yeah. was like an there was like an onion balsamic, caramelized onion balsamic syrup. Simple, good, delicious. What was, was that a sourdough? Yeah, he, this, this is good. Wait, he's doing it great. Yeah, was that a sourdough? Mm-hmm. Sourdough with sourdough. Uh, rosemary and lemon. Um, yeah, really good. Yeah, you missed out, Jordan. I had your quinoa bowl yesterday morning, though. Oh, you did? I did. It was great. Oh, good. I felt clean. Are you, did you come into the cafe or did you take it to go? No, Matt and I sat outside uh, yesterday morning. Mm-hmm. We stopped him, but you weren't there. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was really, yeah. it was great. I, I, during the week, if I'm coming in to get food from your place, I typically get the quinoa bowl, and then on the weekends, yeah. I get the shakshuka yeah. for, for the brunch. That's the, the shakshuka is a great dish, but it's not a big seller on the, on, on the weekends. I get upset by that. I think there needs to be more education. I don't think people probably know what it is. Yeah. I, I mean, especially in the area. I feel like um, Matt and I going there today, what, we, what, we, what, what you brought out really probably wouldn't have been uh, go-tos that I would have said, yeah, I'm going to try that. Right. Yeah, I'm going to try that. But I felt, like, I felt like it was a whole different experience. I felt like I was in a different city uh, trying food, which is great. And I haven't done that in a super long time. Well, I think uh, that's great you said that. I think that's what we tried to create when we opened the Corner Pantry. And, um, you know, we do great sandwiches and everything else, which people, I think, know us more for. But, um, like, you, when you guys came in today to send out those dishes, that's what we like doing. We're trying to create, you know, more, like, restaurant food in a relaxed setting. So That's like my uh, – when you did – I didn't expect that, by the way, today at all. I was planning on coming in and, you know, just – They were pick. new dishes, so I just wanted to, like, send them out and practice. So That's awesome. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed it. That's my favorite thing to do is go to a restaurant and have someone, most – hopefully the chef, send me out uh, – <laughs> All the good food, and that was that was great. So I didn't expect that, and I ate way more than I was planning to, and it's it was delicious. I liked everything. Thank I think you. we really I think we did we missed a couple of things. Did we get through everything? Croquettes? Yeah, we had everything. Uh, the zucchini past tagatelli was is a new dish that went on today. That's good. And what did you get initially? A brioche. I got the the brioche cinnamon bun. Yeah. Yep. Is that what? Or the is, yeah, it was a bun kind of muffin shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. our pastry chef. She's she's amazing, Lisa. So, Lisa's yeah. great. So uh, funny enough, um, the people that are listening who have been with us since the beginning know about the corner pantry because we got the initial chocolate croissants from you guys for the first couple episodes. Which yeah, we, I know we you tried our best. Yeah, <laughs> no, it was it was it, it really was more like a um, like a, like a chocolate bread. In yeah. a way, in that sense, but it was delicious. I mean, yeah. we all liked them, and we ate them for a while. Like, I feel like they, Jordan, didn't you eat like a bunch for like the whole week for breakfast? It was awesome, and just the fact that you guys would try something like that for us was really an endorsement. It was cool. Yeah, you know, because it's more of a French, you know, pastry, so it's not really what we do. But we'd try our hand at anything. When you ask us, like, I'm one of those people that never wants to say no. It's, it's probably something that I need to work on, but I always like, let's do it. Let's try it. So we did our best. That's how we got you here today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Neil, let me ask. Based on your accent, I'm going to assume you're from Baltimore. <laughs> yep, North Baltimore. Yep, or East Baltimore. East Baltimore. Yeah. Oh yeah, I hear the the slight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when did you actually come to Baltimore? Um, 2011, I believe. We moved here from New York City. Okay. And how long were you in New York for? Around about eight years, so I got there about, I think, 2004. Um, I worked for a company called Soa House. They're uh, um, a private members club. They have them all over the world now. Um, but uh, I was working with a guy in London, and, you know, he moved to New York to be the head chef there, and out of the blue one day he called me, and I was, you know, on the next flight out. So it was awesome. Wow. What was that like in the transition to the States? Yeah, you know, looking back, it's a great question because looking back, I always think about those things. Like, what was I thinking? I just moved here. But I think it's just this industry, you just that's what you do. You know, it's not really, you're not always connecting with people as in keeping friends that for, for you know, for life. You just go to a job, meet new people and then move on, you know, as you're building up your career. So honestly, for me, it was more about I lived in London. I wanted to do something new. So New York City is a great place. I've never been to America. So it was like, you know, sign me up. You really jumped in the deep end too with New York City, like right off the bat. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, it was a crazy experience. You know, bars around till four in the morning, which is not anything we dealt with in, in England at the time. So it was, it was a great experience. Great, great experience. It, it really seems like it is the the chef's journey that wherever the opportunity is, you go. Or if there is a, a great chef that you want to follow, right. wherever they are, you just go willingly. And if you have to do a stage, whatever it is, you can yep. you just jump. You know. 
head first into it. Um, where did the journey start? When did you realize food was it before, you know, cooking in London, before going to New York, before opening a place in Baltimore? Where did the journey begin? Well, you know, I, I wish I could sit here and say, you know, sitting on my grandmother's lap, that, you know, I, we were picking berries and that, but that wasn't my story. My story started, at, you know, at school, I was struggling, I didn't do very well at school. Um, and, you know, I saw the careers teacher and she was like, so, you know, you can either go to sixth form college with the rest of your friends who are going to be a year above, you know, if you're going to be a year behind them because you, you didn't do well in your GCSEs or you can pick up a trade. Um, and I had started working in a restaurant when I was 14. So I started washing dishes, that kind of stuff. So it was kind of an easy transition. Okay, let me try the cooking thing. And, um, and even actually a, a cooking school, I didn't really like it either. I know it's just the structure of just being sitting in a classroom. Um, but when I was working on the weekend, that's what I really enjoyed, the interaction with everybody and um, just the camaraderie of the kitchen. I'm sure it's kind of like being a, what you guys do, in, you know, when you're in bands and stuff, it's the same thing. Just being around other people that are really passionate about what they do. So that's kind of where it started. Did you take to any specific cuisine initially? Like as you started cooking and you, you started working in kitchens, were there things that you realized you had an aptitude towards or that you were really good at? Uh, no, not really. I think I just always had, I was always quick at picking things up and uh, was, a, you know, was good at fast paced environments. So my first ever job was at a place called Sloppy Joe's, which was a, uh, an American Tex-Mex joint in the town I'm from. Um, which was super busy. And I, that's, that is actually something that I take from that place, that it gave me speed and be able to work under pressure, which nowadays a lot of people don't seem to have when they come into a kitchen. The food was not good whatsoever. There was a lot of microwaves involved. Um, but that was kind of where I started. And then from there, I just, I just love food in general. So there's no real like genre or anything I like. It's just more of, you know, I'd like to be able to put my hand into anything, whether it's pasta or if it's, you know, Thai food or if it's, you know, making um, whatever it's meatballs, whatever it is. I just like to do the best and make it as authentic as I can. Do you, this might be a bit of a jump, um, but I'm, I'm curious with being at the restaurant all day and, and working there, when you get home too, are you as excited to get in the kitchen and cook at home for the family and you know on the weekends like on Sunday when you guys aren't working are you are you cooking uh no and my wife will, will, will be testament to that no it's it's funny I, I you know when I get home I'm, I'm I feel like I'm a very different person at work I'm very you know regimented and you know I know what's gonna happen by the minute by the hour and then when I get home I just like to relax so my wife's actually a very good cook as well so she'll pick up that area and on the weekends, we, I enjoy going to other places. You know, we'll go and get coffee somewhere. I love coffee, so we're going to get coffee or, or pick a place that we haven't been to and we'll mm -hmm. go there. But um, like I made a lasagna for the kids last night, the zucchini lasagna. But um, no, I'm not, not too handy at home. Got it. So, okay, speaking of coffee, do you have a favorite spot here in Baltimore? Because I can't find really anywhere, aside from your joint. Where yeah. I, I mean, I come in and I'll get my iced coffee from you guys, you know, at, often very almost every day yeah i don't know of any other places that serve a good cup of coffee as terrible as that sounds so the only real places that i, I mean i enjoy and there are plenty of other places but i like artifact it's, it's good mm -hmm. um but the only thing about that is i i try not to do dairy so they don't have almond milk so they only have soy that's the only thing that stops me from going there too much um but before that we would go to at wars but you know, we, we just move around, but um, and I think uh, what's the place in Ham the Spro? Mm. That's not too bad as well. It's good. In regards to uh, steering clear dairy, yeah. is that a just a conscious decision that you've made, or is it something that you've realized that you have some, you know, discomfort? Yeah, yeah. So I don't have gluten either, so no gluten. I try not to do dairy, um, but the dairy thing's hard for me. So um, uh, it was uh, probably around about four years ago I decided I need to tidy up my life a little bit. So I don't drink, um, no, no dairy and, uh, and gluten. And the gluten, I've had a test. I'm just like sensitive to it, right. which is really annoying because I love bread. So as a chef, yeah. obviously that's probably one of the toughest things to deal with. If, if, um, if a patron has some kind of sensitivity or uh, something they're actually allergic to, and you can't serve them that and you have to switch the menu on the fly for them or yeah. swap something. But now it's actually nice hearing there is a chef, you know, who would understand that, not say, oh, this composed dish that I made, you're going to want to swap it now. 
Uh, for you though, when you're making a dish and you know that you want to use something that's dairy related or something that has gluten in it, um, how do you get around that? So you mean when I'm cooking at the cafe or just... The- yeah, I mean, if, if you're going to... So what Matt and I had today, I'm sure there, there could have been some milk, there could have been some dairy, some butter yeah. related, right? there, And then the bread... Could have had gluten in it, like a double no, zero, right? Hundred percent. Well, when it comes to the ca- with the corner pantry, one of the reasons we tried to, we wanted to start it because in the area we live with Towson, there aren't that many places you can go and eat some really nice, healthy, clean food. There's a lot of places you can get fried stuff, or you know, it's just kind of heavy. So that's why we have our cold body sauce today on the ice there. So that changes at eleven o'clock for lunch. We have you know different proteins and salads, and I'm. My wife always says I need to put more salt. I'm someone that doesn't really like a lot of salt and pepper and butter and that kind of stuff. So we always have ingredients around. So we'll have, we always make sure we've got coconut oil and that kind of stuff in the kitchen to cook with and just try and make it, not even for just, in, just general for our guests, to just have some nice clean food. Um, and we have a lot of gluten-free options as well, like especially in the baked goods area. So mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah, they're all, they're, there's always good gluten-free baked goods. And then with the cold bar... That's something that I always look forward to kind of stopping in and, and trying because and we've talked about this a bunch on the podcast, but I started doing more intermittent fasting. Yeah. Like a, that kind of protocol. And um, with with that, Justin and I put together essentially a, an outline of, of good foods that I could eat that would help basically help me manage my macros a little bit better and eat healthier um, while doing this fast and you know, have nourishment. Mm. And you guys always have exactly the 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 foods that i'd be looking for on the cold bar so i'll come in and i'll i'll get you know like the tomato salad and i'll get some whatever protein you have right um you'll have like i don't know i feel like you've had like cauliflower or broccoli salads and things like that and yeah it's just all really good and really healthy yeah and with our with our menu with our menu in general um we're not farm to table but we we buy 90 percent where possible we source locally so we use a lot of farms so everything on there is mostly organic um all our meat is ra- is locally raised like we do a lot of butchery in house so we do a lot of pig butchery so it's just it, you know i just think there's a right way and a wrong there's a right and a wrong way to do things especially when it comes to cooking and this label of farm to table nowadays is thrown around but i think it's just a this is how you should do things you know mm-hmm. buy locally get some sort of relationship with farmers. So that's what we try and do. And it actually took me until we opened the corner pantry to realize that's the way I wanted to go. Before that, it was kind of, you know, I was working in restaurants and having other people's, doing other people's ideas, being the sous chef. But then when we came to Baltimore, I had to really look at myself and be like, what do I, what do I really want to achieve with this place? So that's been awesome, um, you know, building relationships with all these kind of farms and, uh, and being uh, that kind of, Oh my, it's a lot of stuff, especially when it comes to food. And you look in nowadays, you know, especially porks raised and how it's raised, and it's not good. You really need to know where you're getting your food from. So while we're on that topic, uh, throughout we asked people in the Facebook group, uh, if you're not familiar with it yet, facebook.com slash groups uh, slash chocolate croissants, uh, where everyone in the private Facebook group can ask our guests questions. And uh, Kyle Jamison, who's actually from Baltimore, he was interested, uh, Neil, in your thoughts about ethically raised animals. Right. So obviously it's something that you do think about. Uh, is that something that's always been uh, something that was important to you? And I guess my question is, what has been the development of that issue for you? So it's, I, it's, I feel bad even saying this, but before I own my own place, I really honestly didn't even think about it, if I'm honest, you know. I never worked in a, a restaurant. We did butchery, but you know, where we were using local farms or anything like that. So when I opened up the corner pantry and I just started to kind of look around and be like, well, there's all these great farms around. And then one of the first farms we kind of used was Whistle Pig Hollow. And all this stuff is, is, is heritage breed pigs. Um, and when you go out there and you meet these people and you see how passionate they are and how much they, how hard they work for not too much money and you know they're in these environments where they're you know walking around the bad weather and just really trying to earn money for their family and you see it it just really opened up my eyes to what we wanted to achieve so you know again beforehand no but now we really do try our best to uh, use either our beef is locally raised our pork is locally raised um, our chicken we use all bright farm so it's uh, it is a conscious decision now but before it really you know I shouldn't say this, but it really wasn't. 
It's actually interesting because uh, ethically raised or, or finding um, a local farm, you, knowing your butcher, you know, knowing yeah. your farmer, all that kind of stuff is something that, that I tried to get into a couple of different times. And, and I felt like I would put it out there on, on different social media platforms and I would ask for someone locally, hey, does anybody know a place where I can go get, I think I started with eggs. Where's a good place? And I think I saw you guys sell Albright Farmed mm-hmm. eggs and I think a couple of places around where we are downtown sell them as well. Um, but I guess for some people, there's one, the issue of maybe being ignorant and not really knowing the difference between the, the factory farm and then your local farm and whether it's, you know, whether your, uh, your chickens or hens are, are kept, you know, in cages or right. they're free range. And there's all these different words that people use to confuse you. It seems like from a marketing standpoint. Um, but when, when people see, uh, free range and you can actually go to the farm and see how the, you know, the animal lives, mm. it makes, I think, such a different and, and difference and an impact. Um, can you give us some, some of the, uh, you know, you just gave us one, but can, and I guess now Albright Farms as well, but some, some of the farmers around here that you have a relationship with and the farms that you enjoy? Yeah, so, I mean, there are also some great places you can go and buy your meat, especially in Baltimore now, which is great. Obviously, Parts and Labor and then um, John Brown Butchery. I was going to say, yeah, John Brown's yeah. one of my favorite places to go to get the, yeah, the meat. Yeah, which are both beautiful place restaurants, but also, you know, they're people that we look up to um, what they're doing. But um, you know, the farms we use right now for like produce is Karma Farm, which is out um, near, in Moncton area. And then we use, um, we use One Straw Farm. And the great thing about One Straw Farm is they show up with a truck every Tuesday and Friday. And I just go on there and we pick what we want. So when it comes to produce, it's just amazing. They just show up. Um, and John Shaw, who's the farmer, who was the first farmer I met through somebody who worked for me. And the great thing was he showed up, but he wouldn't sell us any produce until he'd met me and he wanted to know what we wanted to do. Because nowadays people say they, are, they use farms, but they're spending like 25 bucks a week with these farmers and then trying to call themselves farm to table or saying that they're using organic you know, produce or meat, wherever it is, and they're really not. So that's, that's something, because of the size we are, we, don't, we can't do things like pickling and brying to go through the whole of winter. So if we ever got bigger, that's what I would love to do. Um, so one, one straw, Albright Farm, we buy all our chickens from, and they do a lot of stuff at the, at the farms markets as well. And there's a ton of farms out there. There's a ton of farms. Just, if you go online, you can, you can find them in a heartbeat. So yeah. With, with you talking about just developing relationships with other businesses in the community, I'm starting to think like there's a lot to what you do. And I'm curious, when you were starting in London or even moved to New York for the first time, was this a vision that you had for yourself or beyond just being a chef, you would be a business owner? <laughs> no, no. You know, it, it, it's my life has completely done a 180 in the last four years. It really has. And, um, you know, I love what I do. And before that, working in restaurants where we owned our place, um, I just love the buzz of it. I love cooking like today just coming up those dishes and we came up with them pretty much yesterday and this morning and then you're executing them and then putting them out because we kind of write our menu on a weekly basis at the corner pantry we don't have like a set menu so that is a lot of effort and using farms and stuff and using product approaches they have available that is really difficult and you know we'll work in you know 16 sometimes 17 hours a day just to produce what we do um so no i, I it wasn't um, kind of where I envisioned myself being. Owning a business was far from what I ever thought would happen to me, to be honest with you. Um, Has it come naturally to you? Um, honestly, it's been really difficult. It's been really tough. And more, just, you know, I thought I was a good manager of people and then you realize uh, I needed to work on that. Um, and that's been a hard thing, managing staff. And the one thing that hit me, which I've, I'm better with now, but first year I was like wow like this is this is my business like this is not just a job I can leave if I'm not happy or you can just bounce this is this is I have to make this work you know we have two kids and I don't want to work for anybody else you know I've done that so it was it was a big slap in the face great it was amazing but I really I don't think me or my wife had any idea what we're getting ourselves into and for context, your wife is a part of the business. She is, yeah. So we also do catering as well. So she's the general manager plus she runs our catering um, division, if you want to call it that, which is, is getting bigger and bigger by the year. So she's in charge of that. Which is a whole nother facet of this restaurant business that you guys have created. 
Yeah, and that's another realm that we, you know, there's a difference between a restaurant chef and a catering chef, which I, I'm now finding out. <laughs> with, uh, with everything that you're currently doing with the business and the restaurant, and all these other pieces to it, including uh, cooking, I guess, demonstrations, maybe hands like live, you know, where you get to work with yeah. you of how to make, I think I saw cookies and cheese um, and a few others, you know, and which I think a lot of people love to learn from the master chef kind of idea. Can you actually break down for us um, the team? You know, how many people, because I think it's pretty small to be executing all of this. Yeah, so uh, that, again, that's a great question as well because, you know, I definitely used to think, well, maybe not used to think, but you, your team is the people that make your, your, your business work. If you don't have a good team, it, it doesn't matter what your vision is if you need people to execute it. And we're very lucky. Like Lisa, our patient chef, who's um, been with us for a couple of years now. She's great. She's amazing, young, talented, and she really sees our vision and what we want to do and just takes us to another level. And then Brian, my sous chef in the kitchen, who used to be the butcher of parts and labor, I worked for the Woodbury Group for a number of years. He's taken me personally on my, not just our business level, level but he's taken me and my attitude to another level because he's very happy you know, he never gets down. So, you know, I can tend to be like a bit grumpy. So he's rubbed off on me. So he's amazing. And then we have Lisa, our front of house manager, who's only been with us for uh, coming on a year now. But she's great. And being able to let my wife be able to step back a little bit um, and take care of the catering and trying to push that forward. So when we have a dishwasher now, but I think in general, I think we have about 13 employees right now. Still super small. In, uh, in regards to the actual menu, yeah. um, Matt was explaining to me, he thought it may be on a day-to-day basis that you'll change. And I think what, what you serve today, was that was specifically for today or is that for the week? Um, it just depends. So our, our soups change daily. We do two soups, they always change. Those dishes will try and run for a couple of weeks. If they're not working, we'll yank them and just do something new. Um, but we're always just trying to, I personally, and my, what we're trying to do there is do something different. You can go to a restaurant in Baltimore and get, I personally feel, a lot of the same food. So we're just trying to do something different, which at times can hurt us because people want to come in, they want to get a certain thing. And Classic. Yeah. But like you guys coming in today, you know, if I hadn't sent our food out, you probably would have gone for a, a sandwich or something else. So we we're always trying to make sure that people know or are aware of what else we do. Um, so again, more of like high-end restaurant food in a relaxed setting. So that's, that's what we're doing. Did you think you would be educating the clientele as much and, and exposing your clientele to so much new variety of food? No, no, no I, I really didn't. And again, I think owning this business has really opened my eyes to what, you know, I need, what we need to achieve myself personally. You know, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard. And um, I don't take it lightly, one, one little bit. And I've learned so much in the last, you know, three and a half years from just owning my own business. It's, it's crazy. And even as a chef, like I said, I honestly had real no idea of what I wanted to do. All right, you have this business now. What are you going to do with it? What food are you into? What, what do you like? And those are all the questions I asked myself. And it was, it was very eye-opening. I was going to say, when you were talking about coming in and getting a sandwich, like when I come in, which as you know, you probably see me, what, three, four times a week, yeah. roughly. Um, I, tr- I try to change it up. Like, I love the coronation chicken salad, yeah, which is so good. I don't know if you've had that, but it's delicious. Um, but the chicken fried rice is like next level good. <laughs> and the, you saw it today. There was a the guy, guy sitting next to us. Yeah, the guy next to us um, with like the pork crackling. Yeah, chicken. Uh, yeah, chicken skin on top. Yeah. Oh, oh, the, oh is it chick- okay, chicken yeah. skin. Oh my god, dude. I mean, it's like it's delicious. Next level. And I've I've had friends that are like, hey, where should I go eat? And I tell them go to the, go to the corner pantry. Yeah, get the chicken fried rice. I mean, it's just so yeah. It, good. Honestly, it's great to hear. You know, because um, I, I definitely am. All, I'm someone that's always trying to strive. Just to, all we want to do is serve good food and people to be happy. That's it. And I know everybody's into that, but well, and you know, it's funny. It, you said to me one time, I forget what we were talking about, but you were like, "Man, I feel like like the underdog." Is yeah. is the summary of what you were saying to me? Yeah, and you know, I walk into the restaurant often, and I see a line around the whole restaurant it's packed in the parking lot you can't park people are like fighting to get up to the register basically to to place their orders and i just think you're crazy for thinking that because and i get it because 
you you really do care about it and you're passionate about the business and you're passionate about the food but do you ever actually get a moment to like when you're in the kitchen and you look out and every seat is filled and there's a line at the register do you ever like take a second to actually look at that and be like fuck this is awesome no i do i do i, I do and i'm thankful for our, how busy we are um but i just have this uh I think I just have this this desire to always just, I need to be better or, I do feel like the underdog a lot. That's a great way to describe it, I do. But that's, be, I feel like because up until I owned a business, um, I didn't really, I worked in a restaurant, but I didn't really think about the restaurant. I didn't really think about what I was doing. It was like, here's a menu, execute this, make sure you know the guy over there is doing what he should be doing. Now I own my own business and it's, I feel like I have like have another lease of life. I can't even describe it. It's really crazy. So it's, it's more about just me just trying to figure out where I want our business to go and, and execute it. And it, like, again, it's hard. I don't find being a chef easy by any stretch of imagination. It's, it's hard for me. And writing menus, that kind of stuff, it's, it's difficult. But I enjoy it a lot. I really identify with an underdog mentality and even just having a chip on my shoulder of something to prove to the world. And I think that's really healthy for me in that it keeps me engaged and motivated. I, I'm curious about for you, does part of that have to do with you not growing up in this country and maybe feeling like you have an outsider with something more to prove in a sense? Um, no, I don't think it is that. I think it's just, it's um, again, you know, when I stopped drinking a few years ago, that was kind of something that this industry, I personally got wrapped up in going out, partying and, and you know, that whole mentality of like work 16 hours, go out all night long and then go back to work drinking, drinking again. And, you know, that consumed my life for a long time and now it doesn't. And I literally feel like my brain is just like being awakened. Um, so it's more of proving to myself that I can do it. That's, that's what it is. I'm, I have, <laughs> I'm not the most... Um, I can be very critical of myself. So it's just more proven to myself and, and not about me personally, but the corner pantry, making sure people realize we're not just a sandwich shop. We are more than that, which I know people do. And that's my insecurities. Just so, but that's, that's all it is. I think people are really seeing that. I mean, and you do get a lot of the quote unquote foodies, like the Instagram foodies yeah. from the area that do come in. Everybody in that world who I know always mentions the corner pantry alongside other restaurants that you're aware of other chefs that i've actually seen in your place like chad yeah or josh you know i've seen these guys come to your spot i've run into them there they're eating the food they're loving the food so i mean i think you're you're right on par with all of the best places in town but one of the things that you mentioned to me too and and when we had that conversation about the underdog thing was you know you mentioned like oh this space like this is like a, a smaller space and i always look back in the kitchen and there's like, how many people work in the kitchen with you back there? Is it like six, eight? No, no, it depends. Yeah, uh, with the dishwasher, it's probably about four or four of us at one time. Okay, because it's like a smaller space for the most part, which... Yeah, it's tiny. But that doesn't mean that it... it that, that doesn't have any bearing on the food that you're, comes yeah, out. Yeah, you're 100 right. Or, or, or the ability to serve a large volume of people. Yeah. Like, it, it really doesn't. And as I was mentioning, like, I've been to you know, different Asian restaurants, all sorts of different cuisines that have these tiny little kitchens, one, one woman or one man shop, and they're serving hundreds of people a night. Yeah. And it's crazy what you can do with a tiny little kitchen. But based on what you were saying, like where you want the business to go, you know, you're figuring out what kinds of foods you want to, you want to make you yeah. try new things. Is there a goal in mind for you to expand either into a larger space, more spaces, or mm -hmm. is it more so creative expansion with the actual cuisine? And you actually, and, and I guess the second part of this, do you really actually like where you are? Because you're really not lacking in terms of mm -hmm. foot traffic through the door right. or volume. I mean, yeah. as I said, it's always, it's very rare that I see your restaurant not busy. Yeah. So I, I always had an issue for a longest time about how small our place was. And again, it was just me just, but just being silly and not realizing the, how good we had it. Our place is very manageable. It's busy. I don't. I now we just we've our catering business picked up, so we're getting a lot of traction there. 
And a lot of people coming to us um, about you know different event spaces that are going on in Baltimore. So that's kind of our next, I think right now, what we're kind of focusing on. Um, but we obviously need a bigger place for that. Just the kitchen's so small. Like next week we're doing a, a sit-down dinner next Friday night for 450 people. And we do all the prep and everything out of that kitchen. So that... The cuisine is always to be something. I'm always interested in learning new stuff. Like butchery was something I had no idea what I was doing. And then Brian has been teaching me. So the last year, that is really... If you put half a pig in front of me in a, year, uh, a year ago, I would have no idea where to even start. And now I feel pretty confident that I can do that. So I just honestly like to... Things I don't know about or I'm not good at, I like to work on it. Um, and that's not easy to admit to somebody, you know, when you're a chef who's 39 and someone walks in the door and you're like... I'm not sure how to do that. Can you teach me? And that's something I've had to, had to really learn as well, of like just being a bit more uh, humble, you know? The humility, though, is is fantastic. I mean, that's yeah. how you're going to continue to grow. And I mean, I don't know. Does I guess to, to, in my mind, age or time shouldn't matter if you're doing what you, lo- what you love every day because right. the goal is to continue to learn and keep doing it for the rest of your life, mm-hmm. you know? So whether you're 39 or 59 or 69, it's like, you should still be walking to a place saying, "Hey, how do I do this? You know, you do it better. Right. I want to learn this. Teach me." And you know, you mentioned pickling as one of those things that you wanted to get into. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, I, I I just over the past couple of years, specifically going to places in Asia and, and eating the kimchi and eating all of these different sort of yeah. like fermented foods, pickled foods. Just it's so good; it blows my mind. So I would love to see some of that show up on, on the menu. We were actually talking about you know the kombucha today. Um, we're talking about wild kombucha which i realized that um i i think i was tracking the food that i was eating coming from like the dietitian (laughs) world right the dietetics world and i was tracking and i i couldn't track wild kombucha so i i did what any normal person would do and i called them and realized that (laughs) they were you know they weren't i was downtown they're not far from here yeah uh i realized that when i was a senior at the high school i went to two of the dudes were freshmen. And um, we started to talk about school and then yeah. uh, a, a connection with the other guy who, who plays in bands. This was at lunch day? What? You did this at lunch no, day? No, no, no. This was, this, uh, I think we were at Atwater's by Hopkins uh, maybe six months ago. But right. we, we were discussing But we were talking about lunch today. Yeah, kombucha over lunch. We were talking about wild kombucha and, and uh, I thought it was cool just to see uh, another connection of just supporting the local community. Um, have you thought about, because we're talking about fermented foods, have you thought about or have you done anything with hex ferments? No, I, I haven't, no. We, we try, that is something we should look into. I know that what they have one at Belvedere Square, right? Uh, um, hex ferments is at Belvedere, no? I don't know. I yeah, they, they have a little booth there at Belvedere Square. Okay. I just know that a, yeah. a bunch of, or not a bunch, but you know, some places around here more similar yep. in, in the style of what your restaurant is will serve their products or sell their products. Yeah. We, we, you know, we've tried uh, that refrigerator, the grab and go area. We've tried so many different things, and the only things that really go out of there is like the sodas and stuff like that. The camp, the kombucha goes really well. Um, when we first opened, we used to have like lots of different foods, and then you could come in to take home chicken salad goes chicken salad, like tuna salad. Yeah, that sells. Yeah, yeah. But um, but no, th- there there's so many things we can look into and 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 try and figure out. But they have a great product. So I have had some of the stuff. You're already taking on uh, such a task of developing new menu items all the time. And when you look at your menu, it's very diverse. Um, the American way seems to, to be to go towards an expertise yeah. and don't end up being like the, the jack of all trades, but an expert of none. Um, how do you balance this idea of, well, I already take on all of this on the menu plus everything else that we're putting out um, to then wanting to go even further to do, to expand to all these other things that you're now thinking about? You know, I don't know. Balance is like, a, it's, trying to find balance is so difficult in, in anything you do. But I just think if you're passionate about what you do and you really care about what you're doing, you're going to find the best way to do it. Nothing kills me more when I go somewhere, especially food related. And I know that the food is not coming from anywhere local or not even just local. They're not making it themselves. They are just buying it off, you know, a vendor and they're serving it. That Nothing more than that drives me crazy because it just, I don't understand in the kitchen, especially if you're going to spend that many hours in there, but you're not going to do what you were trained to do. So trying to find that if you want to do something, you'll find the time to do it, you know, and that's kind of what it boils down to. Um, and people in the kitchen that we work with, Brian, Elisa, and my wife, 
we're all, that's the great thing about the team. We're all committed to the same thing of doing the best we can do. You know, when we first opened our smoked turkey sandwich, which is a huge hit, we used to buy the smoked turkey and I used to just slice it. And I was like, what am I doing? And it was like a moment of like, well, right, let's, let's figure this out. So we started buying local turkeys and we, we brine it and we smoke it ourselves. And that's kind of how it all started. How can we make this dish better than it was yesterday? Mm. Um, and that's something we do on a daily basis. So while we're on the topic of balance, uh, Nathan Bulla from Ontario, Canada in our Facebook group, uh, he has a question but kind of gives his own backstory to lead up to it. So Nathan says, I worked in a handful of restaurants before I could commit to music full time, everything from Applebee's to fine dining to a cafe similar to yours. And while I love the kitchen vibe and fast paced atmosphere, I found the hardest thing about it was maintaining a balance with almost anything else, including a personal life. So between moving to a new country, starting a business, and presumably working nonstop at the beginning, especially to build it, uh, did you find yourself making sacrifices that you didn't expect to have to make? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think in, this, in, a, in any career, especially in a, the kitchen environment, you do have to work a lot of hours. If you want to get far in this industry, especially in the early years, you're not making any money. You're going to be working so when you're in your late early 30s, that's when you can start making money. So you definitely make a lot of sacrifices. Um, and I was fine with that when I'm younger. Now it's more of, you know, with my wife and the two kids and I was trying to find some balance outside of work. How do we do that? And I find that hard because, you know, I, I love the kitchen. I love what we're doing. So I don't want to like step away or, or not be there one day because I can maybe do something new or come up with a new idea. Um, but... You just have to have, I have to, we have to find that balance, you know, if you, you can't just give up on everything. Would, would you say it's been easier or harder uh, doing this business with your wife? Hey, you know, I, it's, it's been amazing, honestly, because Emily, she is very passionate and she's also loves food. She's, she knows it's really weird. So she will mostly write the catering menus. I don't even need to write them because she knows how I think and how, what food. We're both into the same kind of food. So somebody comes to her with like, a, uh, I want to do a sit-down dinner. I'll look at the menu that she's drafted and it's pretty much what I would have said anyway. So obviously being around your wife 24-7 is maybe not the best, but we're lucky that we both have a, uh, the vision that we want is the same. She's not trying to go in one direction. I'm trying to go in another. We both have the same, the same goal. When you look at the menu today, and I took a picture of it, and I'll, I'll post it for the Facebook group to see what's on there. If you can think about that menu, what would you order if you had to have some kind of appetizer, an entree, maybe a dessert, maybe a drink as well? Yeah. What would I order yeah, off the menu? Yeah, what would you order? So I would definitely get the, the chicken liver toast bun today is great. Um, I love chicken livers anyway. Um, the salads are great as well. Like our, uh, our lettuce wrap is really good. We're doing it right now. We're going to change that, I think, next week. Um, and then on the, on the sandwich side, you know, the ham and pickle we do is really good. The, we, you know, all the ham is, again, we butchered it in-house, we brine it, um, and then we sous vide. So we do, do a lot of sous vide in there because it's just, because the kitchen is so small, it's just easier to put it in a water bath and just leave overnight. Um, and then the, the stuff is out of the front, you know, Lisa does a great job. The scones are amazing that we do. The chocolate cookies I brought you guys today, they're a huge hit. Oh and God, yeah. It's insane. We sell like like 80, 80 to 90 a day. It's ridiculous. It's, it's and they're great cookies. I mean um, there's some they're, they're probably the best chocolate chip cookies I've had. Is she baking in the same section that we can see that's open when you're in when you're in No, she's the restaurant like where the, the door is. She's like if you if you peeked in the door, she's there. So So then I was going to bring that up. So one of the things that I really like about the restaurant and I don't. Uh, this is my question: whether or not it's just because of the space that you have to work with, or if this is something that trickles down from you and Emily. Over the time that I've gone there, I've gotten really to know and say, be able to like really say hi to everybody who yeah. works there. Both Lisas, you know, front of house Lisa, mm -hmm. um, uh, pastry chef Lisa, Brian, you know, who's always back in the yeah, yeah. You know, in like the, the window if you're not there. Um, and, uh, you know, when John was there, getting yeah. to know John, who is also front of house. Mm -hmm. But like, is that a, is everyone so friendly and, a, and approachable because that is 
the mentality that you and your wife have and it and as i said it trickles down or is that simply just because of the nature of the space where everybody's kind of out running around in all the places yeah i i, I just think that especially emily is what is uh because she we met in a hotel in new york she was working um I was going to I was going to ask you how how you guys met anyway. But she was working in a she's a graphic designer by trade. Amazing graphic designer, but we met in a hotel and she was doing a room service reservation. So I think her past background of dealing with people on a daily basis and like not just rest, she was dealing with like pop stars and stuff and getting them rooms and whatever they needed. So um I think that she that rubs off on us. Because sometimes I think in, if you've been in this industry a long time, you get a little bitter. People, people complain or something. So my, my kind of first reaction is like, well, they must be wrong. Well, Emily's not. No, let's look at what, how the customer, let's see it from their point of view, which that definitely rubs off on everybody in our business. So she kind of sets the tone for that, especially front of the house. But you know, we have some great people there that have some bubbly personalities, which is good. And, and in this industry, if you, if you don't have good customer service, I don't think you're going to be around much that no, long. You won't, no, you won't. One sec. Um, it's it's interesting you say that because one Emily's always been really accommodating with me and always says hello. Yeah. And when you and I first talked, like, hey, like you know, I'm Matt, you're Neil. Let's say yeah. hey. Um, since then, like, it's always sort of been just this very welcoming place to go, and you know, just even going in and getting a coffee is always nice in the morning because everybody there, there's always someone who's just like, hey, Matt, like, how are you? You know, it's really cool. But I love um, I love when I see Emily kind of like in work mode. Because you can tell, like when she's in work mode, it's like I'm gonna move out of the way, like I'm gonna just step aside because she's on to something, and I'm not even like I'll say hi and I'll be like hi, and I'm just gonna move out of the way. You know, she seems really yeah, focused. And, and that's insane because like she, I agree with you 100. She's not from the restaurant background. She works in a hotel, a so a house. Um, but again, she was in room reservations. But she can hustle and. You know, there's people that come in our business on a, do a stars wherever, and they've worked in it for 16, 17 years. And they don't have the same kind of movement. So, again, we're lucky, and she definitely does a good job. You know what I mean? She's great. Oh yeah. While we're on the topic of people that you are working with, uh, a couple people in the Facebook group, both Edward Smith from West Virginia and also Kylie Cohen from Australia, uh, they had pretty similar questions about hiring. And I'm curious about: Do you guys have some sort of protocol when you are looking to to work with people is it an intuitive feeling what are you looking for when uh when you say yes to potentially working with someone so the front of house we're always just looking for first up a nice personality when they sit down how do they communicate with us at the interview or how they interact with other people um the front of house is is you can find good people not not it's not easy but you can find them. the kitchen is where we struggle to find people because um, you want somebody who's passionate. And that's, you know, that's, that's kind of hard to find. A lot of people like the idea of working in a kitchen, but when you're working a lot of hours, and especially in our kitchen, so small, um, you're working under stress. And even if, even if we are making a load of sandwiches, because you're in a tight space, it's hard. Um, and the effort that we put into it. Um, so in the kitchen side, we're always looking for somebody who has some good restaurant experience background. So they've worked in some high-end restaurants that I recognize either here or in D.C. or wherever it will be. Um, and if they don't, just at the interview, you have to kind of ask questions that you can maybe get out and what they're trying to achieve. Um, but it's tough. It's really tough to find, find good people. So when you find them, you've got to hold on to them. And that's another hard thing. I like the idea that you're thinking about asking the question, what is this person trying to achieve? Because it all comes down to motivation. So right. you could be hiring someone to work for you and maybe their vision is to grow with your company. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're looking to just gain experience and then go off and do their own thing. And I think as a business operator or a boss, uh, that's really key to understand the motivations of the people that are working for you. Right. Um, and then you can best see how to develop a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I guess my question is, is that something you're constantly having conversations with? with your employees and seeing how they best fit into the future of your business? Uh, pretty much. We see, if we hire somebody, see they, they're working hard and we see potential in them and they've been with us, you know, for about four or five months, we'll start to think, how can we keep them still interested in what we're doing? You know, especially as we're a smaller place, I get it. We're, I think people who are career-minded might not look at us and be like, oh, I can go work at the corner pantry, this quaint little cafe 
and in 10 years I can be there and be the general manager. So that's where we constantly have to think, okay, if they're into coffee, how can we make that better? So we'll bring someone in, uh, a girl called Chesna who comes and helps us out and she teaches them more about coffee. So we have classes. Um, and in the kitchen we'll do farm trips. So we'll, tr- we'll take the, the guys out so they can see where we're getting our stuff from or we'll... Uh, we took the, the guys at Christmas time, I think it was Christmas time, to Tip Cow in DC for, for lunch. So we try and just do all these kind of small things. In, in my past, I've worked with some bosses that were assholes that didn't give a shit about what your opinion or how, you know, what you did, what I like to do in your spare time. So yeah, work is work, but we try and find more out about people, what they're into. And, you know, I'm into a ton of stuff as well outside of work. So I kind of like to... I'm more hands-on, like I like to find out about people and my wife is more about, you know, she'll take her time. Which, but I think it's a good balance. We have a good balance. The idea of continued education uh, within a business, I don't think is, is something that probably uh, a lot of business owners are thinking about being the one who's going to orchestrate this. Um, I feel like there may be in certain fields this, um, this built-in idea that you would expect that if people are passionate about what they're doing, that maybe they will go or that maybe the organization that uh, they have credentials under tells them they have to do continued education. Yeah. But that idea to hear that you're actually pushing this and you're helping people um, and the people that are working for you are helping you as well, teaching you about butchery and, and other fields you may yeah. not be interested in. Is this something that you had experienced, maybe with not one of these, uh, the people that you just spoke of who you may have worked for before that didn't give a shit about you, but did you have a boss or did you have someone that you worked for, a chef, anyone, at some point in your career that said, hey, let me show you this or hey, let me take you here and, and so you yeah. can learn from someone else? Uh, no, you know, I did. My last job in New York City, I worked at Stan Social and the chef owner there is Chris Santos. He's a judge on Chopped. Um, Rockstar. Big in a heavy metal. You know, he's in a lot of stuff, boxing and that kind of stuff. But he, working there, you know, really opened my eyes to... Um, he's a kind of a celebrity chef, but it was you had to you had to be on point every day. But he would also take the time to find out about the staff. He knew everybody's name, you know. And we had a big staff at the time. We're a busy restaurant, um, and he would take us out for dinner. You know, at Christmas time, he bought everybody knives. And I'm not just talking crappy knives. I'm talking like from Corin in New York City, Japanese knives. And if you hadn't been there long, he'd give you cash. And okay, in some businesses that doesn't really work if you don't have the money to do it. But we try and have that same kind of model where we'll buy people gifts or if they've worked a hard week, we'll, you know, even if it's just a pat on the back, say, hey, you're doing a great job. But you have to also tell people when they're doing a, a not so good job. You got to, you know. But um, so working for him really opened my eyes to here's the standard we've set. It's very high. But if you work hard, there are, there are um, you know, there are uh, positives to this, you know. Did you ever think of that path, you know, seeing a guy like Chris Santos and what he brings to the, uh, the culinary celebrity world, yeah. you know, or seeing, and, and around the same area, you, you probably see a lot of the, um, Alex Gornichelli has a restaurant, uh, Butter, yeah. I think, right? Oh, in, yeah, in yeah, Lower she's a judge as well, yeah. Yeah, you know, or, or you see, um, now I'm going to like blank on every one of their names, uh, Amanda Freitag. Amanda Freitag um, and Scott Conant. Scott Conant, yeah, yeah, right, so if you... So when you look and you kind of see people like that, or you see Aron Sanchez, who has a, a restaurant down here, oh, yeah. He's right? Hilarious. Yeah. Uh, did you ever think about that route that, hey, maybe I want to be more in the spotlight and be this supposed celebrity chef? No, I, no, because, you know, even coming here today, like, and one of the reasons I, when Matt asked me about doing this, I wanted to do it is because I, I need to sometimes take myself out of, out of my comfort zone. Because, you know, anxiety and stuff like that, I definitely have it. So I'm, the only reason I came was like, Neil, you know, if you want to be able to kind of command a room or have some presence, you need to get out of yourself and do more stuff like this. So the celebrity chef, though, is or, you know, being on TV is not something I aspire to. I would do it. I would do something if I have to. But, you know, I remember one time in New York, we, um, um, Chris Sanders was doing something, a TV crew, and they were coming to the cafe, to, to the restaurant, and he couldn't make it. So he's like, look, you got, you got to do this. You got to be on TV. And <laughs> they filmed me all day long. And when it came to sharing it, they cut me out of all of it. So I was like, you know what? I don't think a TV career is for me. But it was a good experience. But it's funny. But you've, I mean, you've done like the, the morning news here a bunch yeah. from what I've seen. And, and I would imagine that's, that's kind of the same idea of pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. Yeah. But, you know, I, I got to say, like, I don't really feel um, any of that 
nervous energy from you at all and you seem very confident and relaxed in this setting so i mean maybe that is your own mind <laughs> kind of getting to you but I, I think you should do more because i think you do have a lot <clears throat> to offer and you are a, a personable guy and i think people can relate to your story a lot better than some other yeah other those people now i'm not saying go be a celebrity chef if you don't want to be no yeah i know what you're saying but 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 actually this was a this was a question that i had because you know you and i talk about our, our travels and things like that yeah. and the places that we go eat and, and so forth. And I see a lot of the same um, personality traits that, that you have in a lot of these other chefs that I've been lucky enough to meet, you know? Mm. So uh, now this is a whole different, um, a whole different country we're talking about. Like, yeah. but when I had a chance to meet Rene Rezepi mm -hmm. of Noma, what I loved about his whole, his whole mentality was that, he did know everyone that worked in his restaurant. He weekly does, you know, the Saturday night thing. Yeah, that's awesome, yeah. Where, you know, whoever wants to can create yep. a dish and everybody can try it. There's constant education. As much as he can be really hard on the staff when they're not doing things right, he also is really, really keen on, on giving a pat on the back yeah. and making sure that people know that they are doing a good job. Mm -hmm. And the result of, I think, that mentality has been what has driven noma and his respective restaurants mm -hmm. to be number one multiple times so with that in mind you do have i think very similar qualities you actually have a really kind of similar disposition in your personality i don't know if you know if you've ever met him or like but no but i follow him but no I just, uh, really well spoken really mild mannered yeah. not cocky very humble naturally but do you ever have this this sort of goal or dream in mind to, to be the Michelin star chef, to have those accolades in some way, or to be on a chef's table on Netflix or things like that? You know, is that is I mean, you can admit it if it is. I mean, we're, no, I mean, of course, we like all the, the chefs talking about there. Rennie Renzep, I mean, come on, Noma is an amazing place, and a lot of the chefs I follow on Instagram are people that I have would have never have any business of being in the same kitchen as them, but the standards they have. And even the equipment they use and everything like that, we're always, me and Brian are always like on Instagram. And then the next day I'll be like, right, we can get those containers or whatever they're using. Because it's not about trying to copy who it's about. There's a, they set the bar so high and the way they run their kitchen on a daily basis, that's what we try and take away from that. Not trying to copy the food or anything, but take away, how does, how does that guy run his kitchen? John Shields in Chicago, you know, has, uh, has uh, the smile and all those kind of places who works you know, for Grant Atkins, those are all the people that I am interested in looking at. How do they develop their business? How do they run it? You know, The food side of it, I'm never going to be on that level. But as long as I'm happy on a daily basis of what we're doing, but I can take some of what they do from their places and kind of inject it into our business, whether it is how they, how they speak to members of staff or, or how they set up their kitchen. And, and that's, what we, that's what I take from that. But yeah, Noma is another level. I mean, you're lucky. I mean, you've been there twice, right? It was supposed to be twice. It was only once. Um, we, oh. <laughs> I think I, the, the story goes, um, we booked a reservation for the second time, not realizing that it was when they were in Mexico and we were in Copenhagen. Right. So we thought we were booked in to go back in Denmark, but um, we, we weren't. So we ended up going to another place, actually, um, that was, uh, it was another uh, two Michelin star restaurant off the top of my head, I can't remember what it was called because honestly, it was not a good experience. And I don't know if it, whether I was comparing it to Noma yeah. and therefore I was let down a bit. But to be honest, it just wasn't... Oh, see, I don't want to say what it is on the, on the podcast, <laughs> but I'll tell you afterwards. But I do remember what it was called and it just yeah. didn't, it didn't really wow me one bit right. you know, in comparison. It was just ugh, not my thing. But anyway, put it this way. I would any day choose to eat at the Corner Pantry over that two Michelin star restaurant, hands down, without yeah, question. Yeah, I mean, it means a lot. It does. It means a lot. It means a lot. How, how do, you, do you take a piss break on this thing? Or Yeah, if you podcast? need to go, yeah. We can, we can pause it. Absolutely. This is perfect for, for a mid-roll. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no worries. Do your thing. No worries. So, um, wait, I want to... So, no, you're good. So it, it's actually funny. When, when, um, when I was in the midst of, like, heavy traveling... Uh, backpacking through Europe and Asia, living living in Europe for a bit. Um, somewhere around that time, I became more obsessed with food. You know, more so than I had before, and and it was great. I became like what I would call foodie. And we had this conversation before 
uh, before the podcast even started, and I said, "Is foodie still like a relevant term, or is there that?" Because I, I thought that was something that had already passed. Like people were over it. People were just experiencing more food these days. Um, and you guys reassured me that yeah, it still is definitely a thing. It definitely has not you know hit its peak yet. It hasn't gone away. I think where we've all benefited is that we tend to exist relative to the rest of the the culture. We tend to exist closer to the edge. Um, so for instance, uh, my friend who lives on this floor, she's a lawyer and she had a couple come over, uh, they were about to have a baby and I don't know if it was estate planning, whatever, it's irrelevant, but I would say that the couple that I was introduced to because they needed me to sign as a witness, um, they live maybe more in the, in the average of culture for lack of a better term. And I, I don't know if it was, uh, I think kale came up. Yeah. No, and, oh, acai came up. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, so I like acai, an, right? And and this guy, like he he was so confused with these terms, and he seemed overwhelmed by the the just the different foods, and he was like looking at me like I'm still trying to like wrap my head around this kale thing, and I'm thinking, well, for me, kale has been part of like the food lexicon for well over a decade, and it really helped give me perspective of not just in music um, or art, but just culture, culture in general, including yeah. food, I guess I do exist uh, in somewhere that's closer to the edge. Well, y- you have a group of, of friends and peers who I think, given the respected medium or field, is of, of the early adopter, is of like the first 5% who would get into something, so then you would be exposed to it regardless. I know that you and I had, had spoken about um, maybe eating healthier or more nutrient dense foods and whatever else. And I ended up just showing you simply how to saute kale and coconut oil. And that I know for when we were living together for a really long time, there would always be a pot and you'd always be making kale. I mean, it was just normal. Uh, it just takes a lot of people, you know, most people, it takes a lot longer to come around the bend of the curve, you know, get away from those two polar edges. Uh, define where these things are. But it's funny, Matt's talking about Noma is actually like the one restaurant. I remember, and I was saying with, with all this this traveling and being a foodie and really, into, I mean, just super into food from a young age, Noma was the first restaurant where I, I bought a book of a chef and I said to myself and I said to my friend who she was literally, I mean, just obsessed, wanted to like, you know, marry this guy, Rene Redzepi, who we, <laughs> we had no idea of. Um, we were ready to book the flights to Copenhagen just to go try this restaurant. Yeah. You know, I mean, that was, which is crazy to think. Like, you're going to get on a flight just to go do one thing, and then it's like, yeah, now take me home. And it's just more for me. It's more of going back to your question. Would I love to own a Michelin style restaurant? I would love to. Would it happen? Who knows? I'd love to. But, but when you see those, it's just for me. It's about the the thing I get. Rom, the, it's romantic for me is that the when you see the process they go into a chef like that, what he does, that is insane to me. Or even if the, the philosophy behind Woodby Kitchen, the, what they go into on a daily basis to produce what they produce. And then just that, for me, sometimes they even come up with like a croquette and I'll be like wrapping my head. And then you see the food that these guys put out. It, that to me is just, it just is amazing. It's amazing to have that, 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 that brain that they, they, they must have to produce what they produce. For most people, it's probably similar to Matt showed me. Do you know? Do you know about Matt's music? Yeah, you know, yeah, I've seen Louis. Right? Yeah. So Matt will show me a drummer, and he'll just tell me that this guy is like just tippy top of the mountain. And to a lot of people, I think if they heard Matt play, they would say, "Well, that's the same thing." Right. You know, you're you. It's so like esoteric. It doesn't even make sense to the the normal folk. Um, to me, and, and I really like food, I don't find it that different. You're going to a great Michelin star restaurant, and yeah, they have these accolades and whatnot, and the star chef maybe, and yeah. people know. But Matt and I went you know, to the cafe today, and I mean, I, I would put that against anywhere else. Yeah. And I haven't yeah. felt an experience like that in a really long time. You know, of like go, and, and it was you know, serendipitous that Matt and uh, you know, I said to Matt, hey, I'm, I'm going to go like, check out the aesthetic and I want to see the menu, yeah. see how thing, everything's laid out. I'm going to try a couple of things. And then you know, to go in there with Matt and be able to try everything's on the menu and, and see how you know, vast and diverse it was. And again, stuff that I wouldn't have picked out. I mean, it was, 
it, I was I felt like I was transcended to somewhere else. Yeah, no, that's good. But I think it's also good for for me or anybody who's, who's passionate what they do to to aspire to to other people who are better than you. It's like a business. You have to have people around you that are better than you. Like Brian is better than me in a lot of different areas. Lisa is better than me in a lot of different areas. Lisa, our front of house manager, you know, who is amazing with numbers and she's great on the fly. I mean, you if for our business to grow, you have to have people around you who are either as good as you or better. Hundred percent. And well, who have different strengths, right? Than, than you have, because not everybody's going to be able to do everything. And, and we've we've talked about this before. Like you need to surround yourself with people that are better at the things that you're not good at. Yeah. So that you can focus on your talents and really get better at those things and let these other people do their job. And that takes a, a little bit of um, letting go of the reins in, right. in some ways, which doesn't <clears throat> seem like for you that that is a hard thing to do because it, you, you're so grateful, obviously, uh, and, and gracious with the people that you do have with you. And you've empowered them, it seems like. That, that kind of goes back to what I was saying before. Like everyone who works at your place really like you you can see that they know their role and that everyone is sort of a leader in their own sense and that's that's very very unique to see because you don't see that no it is but i that that being humble in those areas is definitely a new thing for me it wasn't that was e it was hard to admit neil if you want to get to where you want to be with this the corner pantry with the food the menu you need help because, you know, when you start talking about local farms and all that, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never dealt with a farm or I'd never dealt with anything like that. So once I started doing that, I was like, I need other people around me to know how, how this works or, you know, the relationships with the farmers. So that's why, you know, having people like Brian and, and other people around us in, in the cafe that have had that experience has been vital. So I was just curious. So I always assumed, and forgive me if this is mm. completely false, but I always assumed that, in your place, you were like, you are the boss of every bit of food that's in there and being served and put out. And it's your vision food wise. And then I just assumed again that Emily was running the business side. Is that the case or is it, or, or yeah, pretty is it much. not? I mean, is pretty it a different much. setup? Okay. Pretty much. I mean, it, it, yeah, Emily does all the boring stuff that I don't have to do, which honestly is great. Um, she lets me be creative. Um, so yeah, she takes care of the business side of it, but she also does, you know, you know all the catering and stuff like that, which has ended up being you know, a huge money maker for us. So she is in charge of all of that. Uh, while we're kind of, I know we just jumped off the topic of being humble, uh, but I want to kind of bookend the story that I shared to to hopefully add value to everyone in this room and everyone listening. So from the with respect to pulling at both ends. I think all successful people have to have confidence and they equally have to be humble so they can get better and admit where they can improve. Um, but with the story with this dude who is overwhelmed by the kale or quinoa or whatever, and then I'm starting to realize, you know what? That gives me unique value to people like him who play to the average in the sense that I can help lead culture, right? And so for you, Neil, like maybe... Your, your dream isn't to be this celebrity, right? But the fact that you're doing what you're doing where maybe the average is just opening up another Chick-fil-A, mm-hmm. it puts you in a very unique position uh, to lead some sort of community. Mm-hmm. Uh, the same way that Matt, Justin, and I uh, become, have become leaders in this podcast community with chocolate croissants, but even also in our respective fields, or at least that's our intention. And... I, I think, at least for me, it helps give me the confidence uh, that overcomes fear. When the fear right. starts to creep in of, I feel like I can do this, I really want to do it, but then do I feel like I'm not good enough? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think people listening to this podcast, yeah, podcasting is starting to mature into a mainstream form of media consumption, but it's still at the edge of media consumption. So I think the fact that you are right now listening to a podcast means that relative to the average, you are leading in some way. And Mm -hmm. I think that gives, uh, or that should signal some unique value that you can provide in some way. Sure. Well, it does. But at, at the same time, it has to be authentic, right? And we've talked about that a lot. Like, in the in, in the sense of what you're talking about, like, okay, kale, 
right? You've had experience with kale. You meet somebody who is like, I don't know what this is. What is this kale thing? You can sort of lead them, but I, I, this, is where I, this is what I love about education is that you can say, well, here's what I know, right? From my own experience, but here's 30 different books you can read. Here's 30 different you know, people you can research that, that will sort of give you this, this full level of detail. At the end of the day, though, it's up to that person if they really give a shit about it. We can, be, we can lead as much as we want to lead, but if people don't really want to take the initiative themselves, then we're kind of just leading the, the blind, so to speak, which, which I'm hoping is not the case. And that is the point you were making, is that if you are actually consuming this podcast, if you are actually pushing yourself to get better in the kitchen, um, then you know you are striving for that. But I just want people to realize that are listening to this, like you can study all you want. You can you can take classes, you can read books, but if you don't actually get your hands dirty with this stuff, with whatever it is that you're trying to improve upon, you're never gonna grow. And you're never really gonna learn. And I see this happen all the time with like I see these students that come and they they They'll go to this drum camp and that drum camp and they'll take this drum clinic and that drum clinic and this lesson with this person and this lesson with that person. And I see them and they're asking the same questions to everybody and, and they're not improving. And at the end of the day, and I, I, I don't mean to go off on a tangent about this, but at the end of the day, at some point, you have to try it for yourself. Don't just read the transcriptions and follow the recipe. Like, figure out how to get make your own. And, and that is leading me to, to my question for you. And I know Justin has something you wanted to say, but I wanted to ask you, Neil, like at some point when you got out of working in kitchens for other people and using their recipes, you had to figure out your own. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know whether you had been compiling these ideas and getting your hands dirty yourself. And as you said, like being in the kitchen is trying things or if that's something that you really didn't even get a chance to do until you opened the restaurant. So the question is like, what came first? Did you have all of these ideas and you needed a venue to execute upon, you know, those ideas or yeah. was it, I want to open a restaurant. Fuck. I got to figure out these recipes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Pretty much the latter. Yeah. So I was working at a restaurant down at Fells Point and super unhappy and more like personally unhappy of, you know, the direction I was going in and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And me and my wife were like, well, let's try and open up a, a something. And we, we weren't sure what we wanted to do. But we were very inspired by, in London, um, Ottolinghi and the City Bakery in New York and those kind of places where you can go in and get something healthy and there's like a buff, like kind of like a buffet like we have and you can help yourself, but everything's food driven. Um, so that's where it came. And then when it comes to recipes, you know, that's, that's definitely an area where I had ideas, but I was like, okay, I, I want to make this dressing. How do I do it? And then there's only one way to do it. You have to make the dressing, figure out what you take out, have a whiteboard and write down what you put in it. Um, and another area where my wife kills me because I'll make something amazing. She'd be like, how'd you make that? I'd be like, well, I added this and oh, shit, I can't remember what I put in it. So I'll have to go back and redo it. So, but that's the enjoyable part of, of, of working in a kitchen or it should be, you know, you should enjoy what you're doing and, and, um, but recipes and all that kind of stuff. I had some ideas down on paper and I had some recipes that I would, you know, amend here and there, but in general, that's what I've had to start from scratch. Who tastes your recipes and tells you whether they're good or not? Um, there's only one person, Emily, she's. She's and, no holes barred, but I, I get annoyed at times, but she's always right. She'll be like, this needs salt. This isn't that. Or she'll even turn around to be like, this isn't you. Why'd you make this? And I'm like, good, I, I have no idea. So That's really cool. If you need backups, <laughs> you know, if she's <laughs> on vacation. <laughs> While we're here, Josh Krotz from the Facebook group. Uh, I try to see where he's from, uh, but he kept his shit pretty private. So let's just say he exists in the chocolate croissants Facebook group. Um, but he's asking, what are some ways to cultivate your cooking style? Uh, for him, he believes he's a pretty good cook, but he's looking to expand his horizons and become more familiar with complex flavors. Right. Um, you got, like Matt was just saying, you got to get in the kitchen and just start practicing. You got to get in there. What do you like? What, what dishes do you like? What are you into? What sort of cuisine do you like? What inspires you? And then there, you, from there, you can move on. You know, but... Go try this, all these great cookbooks out there. Get a cookbook, get a recipe, and then try and uh, recreate that. And then from there, try and make it your own. So take that, oh, if I take this out and add this in, then I can make it my own dish. You're pretty much just a musician jamming. 
Right. So with that in mind, do you consider yourself an artist? Uh, I definitely... It's, I, I, I don't know whether I consider myself an artist. There's definitely, there, there's definitely some art form in it, 100%. And you have to be very creative. And the great thing about the cafes and what we do right now is there aren't at times many recipes. I'll just come in like, I want to make this. Like the croquette thing you had today, the beef croquette with the coconut jus, I had no idea. Well, we've got this beef, I need to use it up, let's braise it in coconut milk, add different spice and stuff to it, and oh, we'll take the, the braising liquid we had left over, and Brian's like, let's reduce that and do something with it. Great, and that's how it came about. So there's, but that is, that is good when you're a small team we have. If you're a bigger place, that's not going to work, because you need to have consistency, which we do because I'm always in the kitchen, and so is Brian. And so is Lisa or Emily's front of house and Lisa's front of house. But, um, but you know, if you're going to be a bigger joint, more consistency, you need to have those recipes down. I have a couple of questions. Uh, everything you served today, even the aesthetic of the plate you chose to, you know, the, for like the platter to serve it on, yeah. to me it felt like it was all orchestrated in a specific way so that you could convey what you wanted to convey. Do you look at the plate or the vessel that you're serving on um, as like a blank canvas and you know that when it comes, you know, people eat with their eyes, you want yeah. to plate it a certain way. It, uh, when the croquette came, one fell out of the way and Matt and I said, dude, come on, use your hands and like put it back in the way you wanted to present it. And we yeah. were standing up and taking pictures and the whole time. Yeah. Do you think of it that way when it comes to plating as you are the artist and now you got to compose the dish? And then uh, when it comes to actually creating food, I know you, you just got into, you know, I'll, I'll try something and I have an idea. I might open a cookbook and try it. Um, when you do have an idea, where do you execute the creation idea? Do you sit down with a notebook? Do you write down or draw out, map out what you want to do, and then try to start executing? Or do you just say, that sounds interesting, and I've got this left over and this to work with. I've got to come up with something for what's left. Yeah, so the, the way it works right now is whatever we have available from the farms or what is in the fridge, that's how we write our menu. And that's what I wanted to do from day one, but it was kind of tough and we didn't have the team around us at the time to execute that. So we started implementing a little at a time. You know, we wanted to make our own sausages, we make our own bacon, we, but we, that didn't happen at the beginning. That was like over a period of time. So um, the creative side of it is, yeah, we'll have, we got stuff in the fridge or whatever we, you know, we'll have ideas in our head and then we just write, at the end of the week, we write a menu for the following week. That's how it works. How far, so do you think a week ahead or do you think in terms of like, oh shit, like the seasons are changing and so when we yeah. go transition from summer into fall, exactly. well, now the menu is going to change just because of what's actually available from, from the exactly. farm. Exactly, and that's, that, that's the hardest challenge is like, you know, these places, these restaurants that are using farms, it's difficult because you have to go visit farmers markets, you have to really think about what you're doing. And he's he just in buying a load of ingredients in is like, oh, I got all these onions and cow and peppers and everything. What are we going to do? Doesn't always, so you still have to have an idea of what you want to do. But so we get the, 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 we get the ingredients list from the farms. And then from there, we'll sit down and write a menu. Um, if something's on the menu and it works, we'll keep it. Um, but I get, I get super antsy and I want to change things and be creative. And that's why we look at when you're talking about plating and stuff like that. I'm obsessed with plates and I'm always trying to look for new things to serve things like those little the little black skillets we had today. They're just I want those. That's I a cheap that one. It's on Amazon. Right, right. You can buy them on Amazon. They're Amazing. Cheap. So we're all, and that's why I look at these messy style restaurants, because that's something I struggle with is plating of food. And you see the how they plate things. That's why I'm always looking at those chefs. Because they're on another level when it comes to plating food. And they might use, you know whether it's like rocks they found out on the street or wherever they're using. But that to me is just like so intriguing how they do that because I really do struggle with that. I think our plate you know, at times is very basic. Um, even just the curry dish today before you got there, we like tried to plate up like three different ways and I was like, oh, this doesn't look right. And then we ended up with that, what it looks like today, which is good, but it can still be better. So tomorrow we could go and be like, right, I've seen it this way. Or Brian be like, I saw this on this on Instagram, whatever. And we'll play around the plating. But I think it's good. It, it can sometimes be a negative thing to always want to change things. But in general, I, I, as long as you're not getting too obsessed with it and you're like, oh, I'm, this isn't right, which I can, can do at times. But in general, mostly, I'm, I'm happy where we're at right at this moment. Where the menu is today, I'm happy with. But maybe middle of next week, I'll be like, let's just yank it. Is there something that you came up with this idea and you said, oh, 
no one's going to understand this. And then you put it out there, you maybe educate it, your consumers, and you went, oh my God, this works extremely well. Yeah, you know, because some of the English stuff we do, I didn't think would be a big hit, you know. So we're not, it says on our web, but British, British, British specialty restaurant. I, we're not, we're, we like to inject some English stuff into the menu. So we have our Scotch egg, and the one thing was the Welsh rabbit. So it's based like an English cheese on toast. So it's like cheddar cheese and Guinness and Worcestershire. And at first, everyone was like, what is this? Once they tried it, they were like blown away. And that was, I wasn't expecting it to sell. And then someone that worked for us before was like, well, if, why don't we just add ham and, and uh, fried egg on top for breakfast? It'd be a crock with dam. I was like, sweet. And it worked. And everybody, it's a heavy breakfast. I don't think we're wrong, good. but it's so amazing. It's so good. So, you know, it's, and especially when it comes to English cuisine, like I'm learning all the time about it. And, um, you know, one of the people I really look up to in the business is Fergus Henderson in, in England. Super high end celebrity, you know, kind of a, has a, kind of a cult following. And we went to his restaurant in London last year, St. John. And it's amazing. It's, it's amazing. And it's so, when you go there, it's so simple. Like the, one of the pork dishes is just a piece of pork on a plate and a sauce. But it's about the ingredients. It's about high-end ingredients just executed well. So that's all we try and do. And I think a lot, most restaurants that are good, that's what they try and do. Use high-end ingredients and just execute it as simple as they can, but as, be, as best they can. So I have three things that I want to ask about, and they're all different, but I'll kind of go in order of my thought process. So the first one, when we were talking about getting your hands dirty and just trying things, it makes me think of what I teach drummers when we're talking about creativity, right? It, it would be very, very hard to make decisions well, especially when you're learning how to come up with your creative process, if you have literally every single vegetable Mm -hmm. every single piece of meat, every single seasoning to pick from. Mm -hmm. So is there a magic number of items that you would say to a new chef, start with one vegetable or two vegetables, one piece of meat. You see where I'm going with yeah. this? Like it's so much easier to, to paint a picture or to come up with a, a creative groove when you set rules. If right. I say to myself, I'm going to play a beat with just my kick drum, snare drum, and hi-hat, and only use my right hand and right foot, it's amazing how far I can go down the rabbit hole with, tho with those limitations and yeah. come up with amazing stuff that then kind of transcends into when I start using more. Right. So is there a mentality like that that you use in the kitchen where it's like, you know what, fuck, I'm using too much. I got to take a step back, and I don't need this, this, and this. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, and, and again, going back to the Ferguson, Henderson, like he, that's his philosophy on food. And I actually, when we worked in New York, they used to do a guest chef series. So they bring over these real high level chefs and we, they take over the kitchen for a week. It was like amazing. And he was one of the people. And I remember I was, I was cutting the lemon off the bottom of the, off the bottom. So it's sit on the plate and he walked up to me and said, how would you like if I cut your legs off? Just let it be how it is. So that's the kind of philosophy we take on at a, a, a work. And if you're using farm stuff, you don't have a huge product list to use anyway. You know, right now it's like loads of peppers and, and, and spinaches and kales, that kind of stuff. But so you kind of have a limitation as it is. If you want to, you can definitely make it a lot harder on yourself. Um, but using the way we kind of be creative, we don't really have like a huge platform of food to use. Well, I notice on your cold bar sometimes you'll do, you'll have a menu or a menu item that's just simply like tomatoes. Yeah. And I always love that because it's just so simple and it's really good. Yeah, you know, but is that sort of that mentality? Like, this is a good tomato. I'm gonna just serve it as is. A hundred percent, because when tomatoes are in season, which we'd get into the end of it now, but that's an amazing ingredient. You don't need to do too much to it. I really do believe in just whatever you're using on the plate. Don't get like you're saying. Don't get too crazy, but also don't overpower it. So if you're using tomatoes, why are you gonna put some you know citrusy or whatever it is, really acidy? slop over the top mm. you know think about what you're using so even just adding and again we use a lot of like olive oils and just plain salts and stuff like that we don't get too crazy on the cold bar because one because people come in they ask a lot of questions and keep it simple so we keep it simple so you know tomato salt lemon you're done and you're just trying to highlight the ingredient you're not trying to do anything else which is great yeah okay that makes sense um my second question for you could could be a big topic but you mentioned anxiety. You mentioned that's something mm -hmm. that like, you know, even coming in here today, it's like, you don't know what to expect, yeah. you know? And I, I try to just be as cool about it with you as possible. Like, it's easy. We'll just have a conversation. No big deal. Yeah. But how does that, um, 
how does that show up for you in other in other parts of your life? And and has it been something that's been a part of your journey, you know, to either push you or deter you from doing things? Yeah, I mean, like I say, I think when I decided to give up drinking and and you know live a a, a simpler life, you know, I think that those that leading up to the point we own the cafe of the anxiety and being fearful of of a lot of stuff, everything. And I, you know, don't know why that is. I'm, you know, right now I try and do things like meditation and that kind of stuff. I'm not huge into it, but when I do it, I feel so much better. But trying to do it on a daily basis is kind of tough for me. But I have like an app on my phone I use. Um, and I was taking medication for a little while, but I stopped. It was a low dosage, but it wasn't really doing it for me. So I just realized that the only way for my anxiety to get better is to try and get outside of myself and do things that make me feel good in a positive way, like doing this today. Even just sitting here, you know, I had anxiety, but just talking now, it's, it's, um, it makes you feel good. So the anxiety level goes away. Um, so it's definitely been a, an issue for me in the past. The last few years has definitely got a lot better. Um, but has it held me back? I think it did, though, especially in London, when I had the opportunity to, someone said to me, like, you're a good chef. If you went and worked here for this person, you would be another level. But I didn't do it through the anxiety of like, oh my God, like, I, 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 that's going to be too much for me. It's too much. Like, so I didn't do it. And they're kind of some regrets I have about my past, that, um, you know, things like that where I should have just been like, you know, when you always go for it. If you fail, you fail. But, you know. Well, that's obviously back. the mentality you've had to adopt now, though, because yeah. you're, I mean, I think you went sort of way further with that by starting your own business and when you left fell's point yeah did you did you keep the job there and start the corner pantry or did you kind of just jump off the deep end no i just yeah we we i gave my notice and um we you know i think i gave my notice and two months later we the cafe maybe a bit longer but the cafe took a bit of time to get together yeah Um, but yeah i quit and that's got to be scary because and i don't know what emily's situation was at the time or like if you had money saved up or family, but like yeah. that, I mean, you're kind of starting a restaurant business is a very, very risky sort of endeavor. Um, I think I put it to the back of my mind, honestly, and that's something that is not a positive thing. I can just be like, oh, we'll open up a restaurant. I didn't really, it sounds crazy. I didn't really think about it. It wasn't like I was like, I didn't have, it wasn't anxiety that wasn't going to work. It was anxiety was I like, good enough to do this. Right. That makes sense. But that's a testament to your creativity, I think. Yeah. Because that's we, we've established that a lot of artists, most artists who are prolific and are always working are doing that because they're competitive with themselves and they don't believe that they're good enough. You know? Right. So that's, that's a quality that you share with a lot of people, which maybe is a comforting sort of way to look at it, which should alleviate some anxiety. But yeah, yeah I was just curious. I mean, if, if that's something that's been um, prevalent throughout the process. But you mentioned too, doing other things outside of the restaurant this podcast is obviously a new one for you but um we talked about the fact that you do mma you know that that you're into mixed martial arts um you have you have kids you know you yeah. you have a wife outside of work as well not a different wife the same <laughs> yeah. wife, but but you guys have your relationship yeah. obviously outside of work so i'm curious you know what what are the other things um you know that you're passionate about that you get to do once you're not in the kitchen and you're not there and and, and that do help you decompress yeah well i you know i i like to i don't do mma i like to watch it um i do a part of it so when we got married i was way i was a lot fat um so when i asked emily to marry me i, I think right now i weigh like 190 but that time i weighed 240 maybe and I was a big guy. My wife at the gym, uh, my wife at the time worked for a gym in New York, Crunch. She was a graphic designer for them. So she got me a personal trainer. And it ended up that he was a professional Thai boxer. So he's like, and I was just loved that. I was like, oh, can we do that instead of just lifting weights? And that to me is kind of, for me, it was kind of, kind of boring. So I was like, let's try something new. So I started doing that and ended up losing weight and then doing it for a number of years. Then we moved to Baltimore. I joined a gym here. And after a while, they're like, you ever thought about fighting? And I was like, no, but why not? So I did. I did one, one amateur fight in New York, um, which is an amazing experience, but so crazy. And with the anxiety, I don't even, it, 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 it was an issue because before I went into the ring, I, like, 
I'd shit myself. Like I was like, what on earth am I doing right now? So um, either I like to do that and I like to stay fit. So I'm always trying to work out whether, you know, it's with a, I have some guy that I see once a week, a personal trainer, or in my basement, I'll do stuff. I'm always on the internet. I follow some like trainers, you know, on Instagram and stuff and I'll pick some of their workouts and do it. It keeps me, my mind occupied. And I like, like I say, I like to stay fit and healthy. And I do not want to be that dad on the beach with the beer gut um, who's out of shape. So that's, that keeps me motivated as well. You know, I have different passions. Uh, most people who pay attention to this podcast know, you know music and pro wrestling and even producing something like this. And to, to most people, they would probably see them as very different things. But, you know, I, I have the self-awareness to see the common thread that makes me attracted to each of those. So I'm curious for you, with the fighting and also the food, do you see parallels between the two? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know I do. You know, I, I, it's the dedication to what you're doing. So if you're a f- doing that fight camp that I did for that to get ready for that fight, the, the, de- the dedication you need for that, and that's why I get a lot of inspiration now from podcasts that I listen to. Um, I listen to a ton all the time, driving my car, running, whatever it is. Um, and when you, a lot of pro athletes, when you hear how they get ready for whatever they're doing, that gives me a lot of inspiration a lot of inspiration and whether I do the sport or not could be, you know, um, I think I, that one I listen to right now is John Brinkus. He, he's a Brink of Midnight. You ever heard that, heard that one? So he has a bunch of people on there that have that Brink of Midnight moment where they play like, live change. And that's like a great podcast because he has a, that different professionals on there. So I think that's one of the best pieces of advice that you've shared with our listeners uh, this afternoon in the sense that becoming inspired and engaging in a different cultures or disciplines uh, or communities will give you an advantage because I don't know how many people who own and operate a place like the Corner Pantry are also really into fighting and kind of consume content within that. And so that's going to make you different in some way, whether it's overt or not. And, And I think that's just really important to sometimes play outside of our sandbox because that's going to help create something more unique that we can share with the public. Right. hundred percent. Yeah. I think when I think of MMA and then I think of your chef's journey, I mean, you think of it the same way that take a great fighter who's a practitioner of one martial arts. So for if you were the martial artist, let's say, and you were going to go fight in mixed martial arts and you were a high level striker under the Muay Thai discipline. Yeah. And you said to yourself, well, okay, I'm 39 now. And you know, when I'm 49, so give me 10 years, I want to be really good at, you know, maybe not an expert, but I want to try to really diversify this portfolio. And I want to be really good at grappling and some wrestling, uh, jujitsu, anything that, that you got excited about. And you'd say, yeah. And because of the field I'm in, I need to get better at this. Um, I think of that, that same, you know, like Bushido, that same like warrior code that you would take to want to be great at at uh, at all these other in all these other fields is the same journey that you're currently on. Of you know what you know because of what you've practiced and studied for all the years you've been doing it. But there's always going to be something different. There, uh, you talked about sous vide, and, uh, um, you know, meats. It's it's easy, yeah. right? And, and just because of of the um, the constraints of what you have within a smaller kitchen, it's like. Most people don't know what that is. That would be this whole new thing where it's, uh, the, your average person may have just learned how to really use like cooking in a frying pan well. Yeah. Right? Do you look at those as, as very parallel journeys? No I, 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 no, I do. I really do. I think when you look at, when you look at a, an athlete or somebody who's getting ready to, to dedicate themselves to something and that, that sacrifice you have to put in to get better at something, Wherever it is, I'm sure all three of you guys have, have had to sacrifice something or dedicate yourself so much to what you do to get better at it. And, you know, when it comes to the cafe, I say all the time, like, I don't want to just have a cafe for the sake of having a cafe. If that's, the, if that's what's going on, let's just sell it. I'll go and work with somebody else and I can get my two weeks off a year, you know, and get a salary. You know, we have a cafe and we work every day and, and pretty much kill ourselves to produce what we produce because of our passion, our dedication to what we do. You know, I mean, it's super important. We try and put that into our kids as well, um, which isn't which isn't easy at the age of six and three. But um, you know, a couple of questions now that you brought your kids up as well. Um, have you thought about, or are they practicing any kind of martial arts? Um, 
also when it comes to Muay Thai and striking, striking seems like uh, if we if we put it in instrument terms, that's the maybe an easier one of the group where where I think of striking is like hitting the piano because it's just there. You can just yeah. smack your hand out and make noise versus trying to play drums. You know, it, to get something a little, I mean, I guess cohesive is a little harder. A stringed instrument, you'd actually have to learn how to push and put pressure on it a little different. Yeah. Um, do you think you went towards the striking aspect similar to the way you like cooking and maybe that you delegated someone else to do the baking because that's a little more chemistry and you have to be a little more, that's like the jujitsu. Oh, 100%, yeah. Yeah, baking is definitely. I'm, that's why I'm glad we have a pastry chef because I, I, because you have to weigh everything out. It's got to be precise. It's chemistry. Yeah, it's really difficult. So you um, can't just start striking at the. You know. No, no, you can't. My ki- my kids. No, I really would like them to, but I, not not anything striking. Maybe jujitsu. Even though I don't do that, I would like them to do it because you know I listen to Joe Rogan podcast a lot and they talk about kids and you know how they you know this just tumble around the floor that's what you do when you're a kid anyway so i think it's important nowadays and not just to be able to handle yourself but the, again the discipline of like you have to be here at a certain time you have to wear this outfit you have to look you know be professional so i think when you whether you how old doesn't matter how old you are even a young kid that's a, they're good traits to have you know do you know jocko willing right do you yeah, know? i listen to his podcast a lot yeah so i mean Jocko, I think, recently wrote a book. I think he's maybe on a second book that has to do with with kids and defending he themselves. A, he brought and, out a kid's book, right? Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he talks about that he, he... I don't know if he says all kids should, but but kids should know how to defend themselves. It shouldn't always be that, oh, I got picked on and then you know uh, right. I told someone, I wasn't sure, and I was maybe now dealing with anxiety of how to defend myself or how to stand up for myself. I think jujitsu is a great medium for learning for learning and a great avenue for that and i also think that uh jiu-jitsu is great because you struggle and struggle and struggle before you get to learn you know you get like one little notch yeah and the belt system and the whole night i think that that journey is is great to set you up for life a hundred percent yeah yeah it's, i mean well it, it teaches you patience and perseverance absolutely it doesn't you don't just go from one belt to the next like like that yeah it's not instant gratification but it's funny you mentioned jocko willing because i'm i'm in the process of rereading extreme ownership right now um it's one of my favorite books for sort of um owning up to shit you know and no pun intended for the the you know but that's what the book's about it's about owning up to right. whatever it is you're doing have you read that book or? i have not i've seen clips on youtube of him talking about stuff that's in the book but i've never i haven't read it when he says take responsibility you know, and and I know Brian Stan as well is the same thing. Brian Stan, do you know Brian Stan? Yeah. So Brian Stan, who is also a military troop, I'm trying to think which which uh, which field he was in, but he, but he he was a leader. You know, and and he took troops with him, and and he said like, no matter what it was, I was the leader of what we were doing, and you have to take responsibility for everything you're doing. Well, right, and so in the book, one of the first stories that Jocko tells is about. Uh, essentially a friendly fire situation that occurs. That's what I've heard, yeah. Yeah, and and the whole point of it is that, you know, he went through every single piece of data that he had. He got every bit of information. He interviewed every single person that, that worked under him. And at the end of the day, there was something still missing. And he had to realize in that in that moment that it was his shortcoming. It was him not communicating to someone as well as he could or him not laying out the plans as well as he could or, you know just setting the rules and something you mentioned earlier made me think of that you know if it if if the food doesn't come out the way you want or if the people in in your restaurant don't work the way that they should or speak to the customers the way that you want it's not their fault necessarily i mean if you you always get a bad egg Mm -hmm. but it comes down to you it comes down to, to emily and it comes down to making sure that you communicate to them every bit of of important detail that right. needs to be communicated you know and that's how i strive to be with the stuff that i'm doing and i'm not always good at it and i know that you guys try to do that too but like man anyway if you haven't read that book extreme ownership yeah no i should I, I would like to yeah and to the listeners too i mean people listening to this it's such an entertaining book because you know jocko um tells these stories that are extremely terrifying because it's it's about war or it's about navy seal training yeah um things that most people don't encounter in in their daily lives and to then apply that to real life business situations and white collar situations i mean it, it's 
it's just really, really interesting and really inspiring. So, um, but it's just interesting. It, it's interesting you mentioned that because I'm reading it again, and it, it it's just such a good reminder of like always ask yourself like, could I do more? Could I do better? Is there really someone else to blame, or am I making myself a victim here when I should be the one that's really taking ownership of it? You know, I think it's also great to just put things in perspective, and obviously, a, a lot of times. Uh, you think what you're dealing with is so crazy or this idea that you have, you want to create something is so crazy. And then you go and read stories of war and you go, oh, actually, I'm so fortunate to be to, to have these options. I'm a fool if I don't go for this. And this is not, you know, and if I fail, so be it. L- you know, I can go read a story that's that's so much more above what I can can even, yeah. uh, you know, imagine that what I'm doing, like, oh, I see the path. People have done this. I've worked for people. Like, you've worked for people who mm-hmm. have done this. So, yeah, uh, you know, hopefully, you can find some comfort and some solace. And like, oh, hey, you know, when when you go to start that journey, you can do it. And I think listening to a podcast like this, this might be. I know there were there were people who had questions in the in the in the Facebook group that that um, that revolved around you know wanting to start a business like this, wanting to open a cafe. So, with that in mind, Adam Sandel from Hungary, uh, he's thinking about the possibility of opening a barbecue-based business. And out of the many questions that, that he did ask, um, I think the one that stands out now for you, Neil, is just business ups and downs and how you handled them. Yeah, you know, that's something I'm still learning and how you, how you deal with that. And um, the ups is always the easy part to deal with. The downs, when you know, for us, when so there's a complaint or something along those lines, that's when it's, it's easy to blame something else other than like, like we're just talking about right now, other than yourself. Like someone the other the other day wrote on our Facebook about the bacon and they weren't happy with it when they came in the other day and blah blah. My first reaction was like, well, what the hell? The bacon's delicious. But when I looked at it, my my second question was to myself, Neil, can you make it better? Are they right? Well, were they expecting streaky bacon? No, they were they were English and they were disappointed there wasn't what they were expecting. Got it. And that hit me in the heart because we do make good bacon but you know what then I looked at it it was a busy day and they could have been right I don't think they were but they could have definitely been right so we looked at it so now we, we kind of looked at our process of cooking our bacon and we've changed a little bit so you have to take the negatives on the chin and be able to look at it and be like how can I All right, are they right and you know when we first opened our business something I had to look at was um, we had a girl that worked for us for a long time and she one day just left and it was because she said it was because of my attitude. And when I looked at that, at first I was like, rack my brain. But I was, it was totally me. And I had to really look at myself and be like, you know, I was taking my irritability out, other people around me, but not realizing it. You know what I mean? And I, that's something I had to really look at. And that's why we try and adopt now, getting to know people and trying to be better, better bosses than just, this is my vision. If you can't deal with it, then there's the front door. No. I want people to come to work because they want to be creative and they're happy at where they're at. You know, and they might not work for us for that long period of time, but while they work for us, I want them to leave and be like, working for Neil and Emily is a great experience. So, it's interesting you brought up the the bacon incident uh, that it was on Facebook. So it wasn't like someone just asked to speak to the chef and inquire about yeah. the, the bacon, but this was done in a very public way. Right. So. Uh, one, I, I'd assume that's a bit more difficult. And have you navigated a way that works for you to actually address these concerns? Yeah, I mean, if you know, we'll always reach out to people, and, and you know, my wife usually will reach out to them and respond. And most of the time, people don't respond back, uh, which is a bit disappointing, you know, because you want to know that that you, you you're taking their, their criticism or, or whatever it is, and, and and trying to do something positive about it. So you know, Yelp and those kind of things, you always reach out and say, you know, sorry, you had a bad experience. How can this is how we can next time you come in, ask for me and Emily. And I think own a small business, that's a good thing that people can come straight to the owners, and we're there every day, and talk to us face to face. And um, when they see when people see you working hard at what you do. That, that definitely will tame them down a little bit where they'll be like, all oh, right, you know, this wasn't right, but they're trying their hardest, you know, which is, that's a great thing. Yeah, and, and even if the person doesn't respond, if you are responding, you know, through the public forum of, of Facebook yeah. or whatever else, everyone else is going to see that too. Right. And see that you guys actually give a shit. Yeah. And that's going to go a long way in, in people believing in what you guys are doing. 
Yeah, hopefully, yeah. So, you know, you've got to take the rough or the smooth. And, but, you know, I, I wish I could see her and tell people that own a business is uh, this smooth ride. It, it's not like anything in life you want to it, – it's, it's tough. Um, but as long as you have your standards and you set them from day one and you don't kind of diverse from that, um, in general, you'll find you'll be okay, you know? Very cool, man. Uh, with one final question from the Facebook group, and then if Matt and Justin, you guys have any others. Uh, this comes from Jordan Goodman from Baltimore. Uh, so that's actually me. Um, <laughs> was, was the name of the cafe, did it come before or after you chose the location, which is a corner of a, of a shopping strip? Yeah, it came after. Um, and I can't for life remember how we came about. Yeah, it was on the corner, and I think we wanted kind of like an English, he kind of inspired you know, name. So the corner pantry came up. Um, for the long, our logo, we have an English bulldog, so our logo is an English bulldog. So for the longest time, people thought we were a, 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 a shop, a food shop for, for dogs, which wasn't good at the beginning. But, um, but yeah, the, the name just came about me and Emily just looking through the internet and trying to figure out what we're going to do. And the pantry kept coming up, cat pantry, and we liked that that kind of catchy name. So, well, With that in mind, when you guys did open up shop, what were some of the first things that you did to draw attention? Did you, you know, actively seek out media? Did you have any pre-release kind of, you know, invitations to the community to come and check it out? At first, no, we didn't. We just opened up and and uh, went from there. Um, but then, as we got um, a little bit more respected, and people knew who we were. Then the media starts to come, and then um, you know, like next week we're doing a dinner at the Four Seasons for cystic fibrosis and that kind of stuff. So it's more about Again, putting yourself out there, whether it's sitting in a podcast or going out to the community and doing something, that's kind of um, how it came about. But I think if you're putting out a good product and you're doing a good job, it's going to come to you eventually. You know, the people will reach out to you and want to be involved with you somehow. You know, so keep on. Yeah, I've been impressed with it. I, Justin was asking me like the first time that I came in, and I don't even remember who told me about it or why. But I remember going there. There was another restaurant there prior, yeah, um, that I used to go to every now and then. But I don't remember what brought me in. Um, be more Brian. Huh? I forgot. Don't know his name. It uh, might have been Brian Stander. Yeah, yeah, be more. Be more Brian. It might have been Brian. Um, it, that could have been it. It could have been it. Or Josh from Smoke may have been one of the ones. I just who, remember when he came in. I met you, and then I was like, I don't know why or how it came about. I looked you up, and I was like. This Guy's got so many followers on Instagram. What, what is this? And then I started looking into it. And I was like, "Wow, this is crazy!" <laughs> and then you would put something on your Instagram about our place, and they would get all these comments. And I'd be like, "Wow, that's the power of media, social media nowadays." You know, we have some of the does, helps with PR, but your phone nowadays is just it's just genius that you can just put something on social media, and you know, you, people will kind of flock to you if they like it. Absolutely, and I mean, I like the bragging rights of finding good restaurants. Yeah, you know, like that's that's one of the things that I love to share with people and be like, look where I am, and look at all this good food, and I get to eat it, and hopefully you will too. You know, that's that's what I love to do, but it works on all levels. I mean, it 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 brings people to my socials who want to see that kind of stuff, but in turn, it's going to bring people in hopefully to your restaurant. You know, I've seen that work now over and over with Smoke mm -hmm. in particular. Like I used to go in there and post pictures of their sandwiches all the time. And now Josh is getting people that constantly are going in there being like, yeah, Matt sent me or like, you know, I yeah. saw he was eating here and this is, this is where I got to go. So it's, it's a useful tool in, in every sense of the way. We do it on tour all the time. And one of my bandmates, Mark, who's been on the podcast, every good restaurant that we'll go to on tour, he'll tweet about it or he'll, you know, he'll tag them. And a lot of times, you know, it ends up being like, you know, they'll, they'll either give us free food or they'll like, you yeah. know, they'll shout out to the band or they'll promote our show or They'll just simply say thank you, which is huge. And that's how we got into Noma. Kind of last minute was Mark tweeted at Rene Rezepi and was like, hey, we're going to be in Copenhagen. Can we come? And I guess he just looked at his profile and saw what was going on and was like, we'll fit you in. Like, we'll figure that's it amazing, out. Yeah. We'll get you in. Because it's really hard to get in there. You know? Oh, yeah, I'm sure. So, Where um, did you go where you cooked food? Um, that was in New York City with um, my friend, Chef Brian Sal who uh who's a, a new york chef and has his own thing now um but yeah like he he did a, a metal cooking show where he he invites all sorts of different um guys from metal bands to come in and 
cook in his kitchen and it's like a cooking challenge. It's pretty fun. You should look at Chris Downs because he has a, like a, a band production company now. He does, I don't know mm-hmm. what he does, but he's big in a heavy, heavy mail and that kind of stuff. He's, it's interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, and I, Chris was actually, so I went up to New York for the Revolver Music Awards. Right. The Golden Gods is, is what it was called. And Chris was there. You know, he was there, you know, I shook his hand, met him really briefly. Wasn't anything formal, yeah. but just enough to be, you know, he was talking to people that I knew. Um, but yeah, he's definitely involved in like the New York metal music scene and, yeah. and stuff like that. So it's it's been cool to see how many people are really actually embedded in that kind of thing. And, and metal in particular, like there's so many bands that, um, that get a chance to eat when they travel. And, and that's like a thing. Like I, I have friends in this band called Revocation. And they're actually their ex drummer Phil hit me up recently and was like, "Hey, I'll be in D.C. like just for lunch. Where should I? Where should I go?" And I sent him to that Chico place mm. that I was telling you about. Um, but you know, there's just this culture of food and music that's sort of completely linked. Yeah. You know, um, and then when you look at Instagram, when you look at like the like the major hashtags and the things that are popular, it's like fitness, food, music, and you know girls butts <laughs> they're all super connected all super connected <laughs> while we're here and because most of our listeners uh music is central to them uh what role if any does music play in your life <laughs> so um i mean I, I you know growing up music like bands stuff like that wasn't something i was into i grew up where it was more people probably gonna laugh like house music and going to clubs and stuff like that so that's why i was and I still kind of listen to that music nowadays. Um, but I just like easy listening. So, you know, but again, once I found the podcast, like I, I don't listen to hardly any music now. Right. Which I know music should be, I think it should be an important part of people's lives. But, you know, just listen to the podcast, just taking that away. When you're in the kitchen, is there audio going on, whether podcast or music? No, I, I can't stand music in a kitchen. I'll, I'll listen sometimes in the morning. I'll try and listen my headphones on because I get to work super early. But even now, I can't concentrate on what I'm doing, so I just don't do it. But um, yeah, um, no, I actually think it's interesting. I, I know that uh, we kind of do an open gym down the street, uh, and my coach in powerlifting, uh, he'll put on music. It won't be super loud, nothing crazy, because he wants to be able to communicate with everyone. Yeah, and he also doesn't like if we have headphones and we can't hear him, and he wants to make you know a cue. You know, oh, there's a cue. So I mean. Um, it's funny you mentioned that podcasts have taken over from music because we had an, the last episode was just the three of us and we dove pretty deep into talking about music and we haven't really done that. And and as I, I was talking about that stuff, I, I really realized that MMA podcasts specifically won the MMA hour, which is now like five, six hours mm-hmm. on a, every, every Monday. Yeah. That takes up the bulk of my time driving, uh, listening to something on my phone. It's... Podcasts, but they, they they also you know not just with the MMA podcast they they talk about a lot of diverse subjects as well they don't just specifically talk about MMA and that's why I kind of like the 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 Jaco thing and it's not, you know nothing to do with MMA but he even when they had I can't remember his name but they had some guy on there that was um you know uh, an an ex um, Vietnam veteran that got was you know imprisoned and he was talking about it's funny because he was talking about a pencil these the person in the prison sold him. And he was getting driven mad about the pencil, but then he realized it wasn't about him. The pencil it was how can he change himself into not being annoyed by this guy with the pencil. It wasn't about the guy with the pencil. It was more about how do I change myself to look at him and be like, why is it annoying me so much? So that's what I kind of like about him because you get different things from it. Plus, you get they talk about a ton about fighting, which I I like. So, so as we start to wrap up, Neil, um, I checked out your Instagram just shortly before you came here. A lot of cool content there. That's a way that people, you know, who are living in Australia or hungry, uh, can interact and kind of see what's going on with you. Uh, if you're local to Baltimore or Maryland, I know you guys do different classes yep. throughout the year. So, whether website, Instagram, etc., how can people follow you guys? So we have obviously Chef Neil Howe on Instagram, or we have the Corner Pantry. Um, we also have obviously our website. You can go to. We have cooking classes on there. And all the stuff we're doing, you know, next week, catering's on there as well. So all the ton of events, the events that we do are on there, uh, which is the corner slash pantry.com. Cool. 
Uh, and if, if you're looking up Neil, uh, it's two L's, but just look at the info of this yeah. podcast you're listening to and it'll be spelled correctly. Um, dude, thanks for coming. I had, a, I had a blast. Thank you so much for having me. It's just crazy, yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, you said this is the first time you've done something like this, maybe going a bit deeper than on TV. Uh, you're a natural. Well <laughs> thank done. Thank you. I appreciate it, yeah. yeah thank man. you. Thanks for having me. It's great. Absolutely. Yeah. Please do this more. And, and thank you again for food earlier. <laughs> and the cookies. Yeah, no you were one of the first. I, I mean, when we first started this, as, as I said before, I came to you not only f- to see if you can make us croissants, but you were one of the first people that I was really curious to have on just because of what little knew about uh, what little I knew about your story coming over from the UK, being a chef in the States, meeting your wife here, building a family here, building a business here. It's a pretty interesting story. And it just seems like you've, uh, you've definitely figured out your direction, which is very, very inspiring for a lot of people to hear about. So I'm glad we finally made it happen. Yeah, thank you, know? you so much. Yeah. yeah no and worries. thank you for uh, small plates with great ingredients and, and, uh, doing justice for simple ingredients just because the the American way is so lost with those huge plates and those oversized portions and whatever, you know, when it comes to quality control and just adding more of, of what we know will be pleasurable to the brain and people right. won't be able to stop eating. So thank you for doing what you're doing because as we talked about earlier, you know, uh, educating people and, and creating community and, and just educating your community we, I mean, I really appreciate what you do. Thank you so much. Yeah, it means a lot. Thank you. We also want to thank all of you for listening to this podcast. As always, we are immensely grateful for your attention. Uh, this has been episode 23. Episode 24 will be next Monday. And if you join the private Facebook group at facebook.com slash group slash chocolate croissants, uh, you will have an opportunity to ask questions to that guest. All right, so we want to see you guys in there again every week. The engagement has been incredible, and it frankly inspires us to continue doing this every week. Uh, if you have a podcast app on your phone, whether it's Google Play or Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, et cetera, et cetera, uh, type in chocolate croissants in the search bar. You can subscribe. That way, you get it downloaded into your uh, phone every Monday morning, and uh, then you're not using your data to listen uh, to the podcast, whether you're in your car like Justin and most of us, I'd assume now, as we're listening to to the audio content. Uh, If you want to go over to iTunes or Apple Podcasts and rate and review Chocolate Croissants, again, that helps us. Uh, But really just thanks for listening and thanks for the attention. We always appreciate it. So we will see you guys this week in the Facebook group. We will see you next Monday morning with episode 24. Again, we want to thank Neil Howe from the Corner Pantry for joining us this week. And until then, bye-bye.